10 years and um, thank you very much for inviting me Poets and Fairs and Manchester Literature Festival and thank you for that very beautiful start to the afternoon. That was a lovely introduction Janet, thank you, but um, a lot of the time I am actually called um, Rachel um, uh, and I actually know quite a few Rachels who get called Rebecca. Um, <coughs> So I think it is just a thing with those names. Um, anyway, one, one week it sort of happened a lot, and I just thought, oh, sorry, I'm going to write Rachel Pye. <laughs> Rachel. I spent the day being Rachel. I introduced myself as Rachel to a stranger at the library when we reached for the same copy of the new encyclopedia of birds. I apologised in a way Rachel would have apologised, prone to genuflection. I let him take the book and wedge it under his armpit so he could bend for his umbrella, just as I was telling him my name was Rachel, but he turned and headed for the loan's desk. I decided that as Rachel, I wasn't interested in birds after all, and anyway, I didn't have a library card signed by Rachel in black felt pen, so I hit the big circular button with a picture of a wheelchair on it and waited for the doors to open fully. I walked around the town, in rain that fell as if it was undecided about its volume. Scant bursts would be the best way to describe it, had someone telephoned, and after I'd said, hello, this is Rachel speaking, told me about the weather. There is another um, Rebecca Goss out there, and she is actually a professor in organic biomolecular chemistry at the University of St. Andrews. And, um, a couple of years ago, she sent me an email just to say hello. Um, and we've shared a Google search for about a decade, and uh, I've read a few of your poems. And would you like to collaborate one day? Uh, so we are now in the in the throes of talking about collaborating and doing something about women and mothers and science and that sort of thing. But we met in Skype, and um, she's really, really, really nice. Seriously, seriously clever. I'm about 15 minutes behind her the whole time. And, um, but it turns out we've both got Instagram connections, we're of similar age, we have daughters of a similar age. So before any kind of project has started, and I really hope it does one day, um, I decided to just write a poem about sharing with them. Nomenclature. How long did we look at our mothers from the safe ledge of their hips, hear the word Rebecca spoken, whispered, all that soothing, pointing, until eventually its hard end vowel was the turn of our heads. Loved for its length, something to offset our surname's syllabic lack, it suited us. We were firstborns, we were Rebecca's, we grew our hair long and straight. With eager grips on beryl, the shared appellation practiced on pages of faint rule, school shaping us into very different women. In chemistry, your teacher made sugar syrup for his bees, you witness the substances of which matter is composed. Science declared itself to you. Me, I was a smoker, occasional truant, but really a good girl, unable to resist when a teacher placed Faulkner in my hand. I'm ahead of you by two years, reached certain freedoms and discoveries earlier. University, motherhood, I got to sign our name inside the covers of slim books. You weren't far behind me, on dance floors, that stirred you until late, with lovers, knowledge forming a ziggurat in you. What do I really know of this? I know your daughter raised her head when she was born, locked eyes with you in a stare as you held her shiny, intended body. I know because you wrote it down, out of all the things you could have told me, and knowing it has made me realise what we both have, finds me turning back to reach for you. Earlier this week, I went back to my, my old school, which I was kind of slightly traumatic, to um, give out a prize for creative writing. And um, I really, really wanted to read that poem. I have, I have to read a poem as well as give out a prize. And um, but I thought a poem that involved my school life and me bunking off and smoking bad probably was the best one to read to uh, a group of TCSE students, so I read Rachel instead. Um, the, the cover of my book is um, a painting by the artist Alison Watt. Um, I don't know if you know her work, but um, I am completely.
completely obsessed with her work. And um, I saw uh, a couple of her paintings for the first time at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, and they're massive. This um, is a beautiful cover, but doesn't really do it justice. They're enormous canvases of white folds and twists of fabric. And um, the little blurb by the side of the painting um, said in the Walker that she was an artist who was um, who explored the erotic connotations of fabric, um, and that really appealed to me. Uh, so um, I then went away, thought about her work for a long time, then kind of stalked her for a bit, and blah, blah, blah. but anyway, eventually we wrote a sequence of poems which are in here, and um, she got wind of that, and uh, we got in touch, and we had a sort of gentle correspondence going on, and I actually ended up launching this book at a gallery in London where her work was being exhibited. And, I feel truly, truly honoured and privileged to have her work there. So I'm just going to read one of my Alison Watt poems, as I call them. And I never ever attempt to describe the paintings. Um, the paintings are really about how they make me feel. The poems, rather, are about how the paintings make me feel. Fabric, and this is after her painting Black Star. I woke alone and searched for you where I thought the heat of us might be clouding in that yawn of fabric, my fingers pushing into its slate dark, back into our universe of night, when you gathered the whole of me and I pulled you under, so we could explode everything cold or white about this space until the breath we had came out as flares and I was the one to surface. Um, I work, been working with a photographer for about a decade, and he ended up being a really good mate of mine. He's called Chris Rapid, and he's based in the Northwest. I met him when I was living in Liverpool, and um, we've uh, we started a, a blog together where he would send me a photo and I'd write a poem, and it was all very informal, and we never shared it much with anyone. It was just a nice thing to do together. But anyway, you know, eight, ten years later, it's become a book called Carousel, uh, published by Gillingham Press, came out last year. And um, Chris currently has his first solo exhibition at the moment at the Heaton Cooper Gallery in Cumbria. I do not have that. Um, and uh, uh, yes, the book is 15 photographs and 15 poems. And it's, it's, it's um, hard to read from sometimes because I do think you need to see his photographs at the same time. But I'm just going to read the first one in the book, which is, I don't know if you can really see it, but it's just a, a, a landscape. He takes pictures of all sorts of things, but a lot of landscape ones. School. This isn't Kansas, but whatever's brooding at that furthest part of sky, it could come for us, could take us with the rapeseed yellow, wrap us in the pale gravel of this track. Inside the swirl, it'd be your body and my body, and unbelievable clouds. We'd hear the horror of a dog, but not see the dog at all. My hair would be going crazy. Then everything would calm. The storm would give back all that it had claimed. Laundry, umbrellas, a tumble of babies with burrs in their mouths. The two of us, reset on the ground, cold, breathless, but more informed of sky, more akin to clouds, having felt their altitude and sweep. Then I'm going to briefly read from my last book, Ever. Which is, which is about the death of my daughter Ella in 2008 from a rare heart condition. She lived for 16 months, and I've spent an awful lot of time reading from this book in the last several years. Um, and it's a really, really hard book to read for a long time from, but it's also a really tricky book to read just one poem from, <laughs> because there's a long story in here. Um, but it concludes with the birth of my second child, Molly. I do like to think there's a bit of a happy ending. And she was born in 2010 healthy and well, and she's doing absolutely fine. Um, but uh, I haven't always found it easy to read from the book, and um, I did shelve it for a while, but actually, now I have other books, uh, I kind of want to mix it up a bit more. I'm not abandoning it on the shelf like I did for a while. So I'm going to read the title poem, and he'll be also embarrassed that the, the beautiful cover, the artist who did this beautiful cover is actually here today, and I own the original watercolour of this. And it's a very beautiful thing. Her birth. On the wall, two news, painted in Walperswick. I call to you, say, that's a good omen, that's a good sign. 
before buckling, gripping the hospital bed. What was because we're on holiday, every childhood summer, it's where we announced the news. Sixteen months after the effort of her birth, we collect a faux walnut box from Jenkins and Sons. Inside, a clear sachet, weightless as dried herbs. We drive 281 miles for that cold, unstoppable wave to suck the sachet clean. And I ask you, she is all right now, isn't she? She is all right. I uh, read, read an article in, the, um, in a newspaper one day uh, about uh, a woman who had been struck by lightning. Um, and if you'll pardon the pun, it was extremely striking where the lightning entered her body and where it exited her body. And anyway, as soon as I read that fact in this article, I knew I was going to write a poem about it. But I found it really hard how to, where, what was my entry point into it? I didn't know whether to be her or to write about it. But in the article it said that she recovered from the lightning strike and eventually she was very poorly, but then she had a child. And I thought really I had to write a poem from the point of view of her son, because that really must be quite a thing of wonder to have a mum who was struck by lightning. The lightning. First, it split a tree, then tripped across a barbed wire fence as my mother watched, thrilled. It entered through her feet, threw her ten yards onto grass, where it briefly stopped her heart, burned nerves, fused her jaw, and exited through her mouth. She tells me this countless times, and each time I see her jerking on the ground, stricken with bolts, her mouth spitting rods of light. She had to relearn writing, walking, reading, speaking, but eventually repaired to have me, let me float in the bowl of her womb, only to be born and find her wheelchair back. Blood vessels of each foot destroyed, her ten toes finally gone. I grew up in the seat of her lap. Once level with her throat, I strained to see inside her mouth, find its trembling silver pool. Tonight, her bedtime whispers grow fiery in my hair, and when she thinks I'm sleeping, I'm half hidden in my doorway, watching her glide back down the landing, all her fingers trailing sparks. Uh, I live in East Anglia, but I used to live in Liverpool, and I lived there for 20 years, and I lived quite close to the River Mersey, and um, I used to, I could, I would regularly be found on the prom, uh, walking my dog, or pushing a pram, and um, one day, two middle-aged men jogged past me, and, uh, and they were laughing, and to each other, not to me, I think, and I just, I remember thinking that it sounded like the laughter of successful men. I can't really describe it any other way, but just remember thinking that. And then I spent the rest of my walk making up lives for him. Jogging with Roger. <coughs> he likes the choreography, how they convene for synchronised stretching before pounding in tandem, all set to the reassuring bounce of their cocks. The talk is of money and risk, money and luck, and though he never looks at his long-time neighbour, he knows Roger is sweating, his face turning puce. Roger doesn't know the details of his life, that he thinks about sex most of the day, or return home to shower, where yesterday's shirt smelled the tang of his assistant still on his cuff. He wonders if Roger likes to taste sweet, weak women, if Roger has secrets too. He thinks about Julia, staked on a lounger, honeying her limbs, how he pretends not to notice Roger's spectacular wife. They circle the oak on Oak Tree Drive, pant the last stretch home, their finish rewarded by the first glare of sun. As they bend to grip knees, he notes their heavy watches, the year-round tan to their arms, but it's the ring of grey, sticky on Roger's scalp, that renders him stricken, knowing it mirrors his own, leaves him wheezing on concrete and another day's light. And I'm just going to um, finish with a poem about friendship, uh, really, because um, I have 
two particularly close girlfriends, and this is one about one of them, the other one's still talking, pissed off, I haven't written about her yet, but the other one, um, this, is, this is it, but it's my, I've often said to people that I think, I think for girls especially, uh, you know, when they are teenagers especially, those, those intense friendships that you have when you're a girl, they are like a form of first love, they, I've always thought that, and I'm still in touch with um, you know, a couple of girlfriends from school, still feel as close to them, but also the, the friendships I have now, in my 40s, feel as intense and as important to me as my teenage friendships. And this poem is about me trying to sort of fit an entire, into an entire friendship into a page. With Sarah. We headed for Kenwood House, walking very close to each other, the way women can. We lay on the grass, looked back at the south facade, that wide bank of lawn, children running its irresistible slope. I talked for a long time about sad things. You responded with those pauses you are capable of, as if a web is breaking between your lips just before you speak. But it means you've heard everything I've said. We didn't stray to the woods or come across the Hepworth, slide our arms through a gash in stone. We stayed on that grass, and beyond us, pregnant pipistrales hung in their summer roosts, wings folded around gestating pups. I don't remember leaving the heath, I returned to Brixton. I don't remember my further stretch back north to marriage. Years later, you went to Bahrain to witness the curved liberties of others. I was proud of you, working in a place I didn't know or understand, but you felt only guilt in the hotel pool, your body breaking the water's warm surface of leaves and flowers while your family slept 3,000 miles from your touch. Perhaps swimming will always make you think of them, Think of the day you breathed and paced around your flat, lowered your swell into a blue plastic pool, the relief of water at the split of you before the baby rushed. I met him, your first child, at the funeral of mine, on that hot walk from the church to my house, and I grabbed you and kissed you and kissed him, but couldn't talk. Then there was last month, beside you again, watching my daughter, your sons, Curious at the Horniman Museum, their small fingers pointing to exhibits, choosing to stroke an eagle and a mole as we stood behind them, guardians of coats. After lunch, we took them to fly kites, let them run in open space, bright flapping far above their heads, and it felt as if I'd always been heading to that point. To be with you, in the park, watching our children cast themselves into flight. Thank you very much indeed.